Hi, this is Dr. Michelle Robin with Small Changes, Big Shifts, Building Rhythm and Resilience. And I believe if you'll change one thing a month, one thing for the next 12 months, you'll change your life forever. Thanks for joining me on the journey. Welcome back to Wisdom Wednesday on Small Changes, Big Shifts, Building Rhythm and Resilience. Many of you know that uh, about six weeks ago, as it started coming down, my spirit started saying, Michelle, you've got to find a rhythm so you can have resilience during this reset. And I thought, if I need that, so do my friends. And so I reached out to my other friends so they can help us build that. And we've been doing, we did Motivational Monday this week, and then um, Total Health Tuesday with Dr. Jay Dunn yesterday. And then we're doing Wisdom Wednesday today with Ron and Beth Hall. And then Thursday, we're going to be doing a uh, talk story Thursday with my friend Sonia Choquette, and then Friday will be with Meredith, Meredith Suarez. So that's kind of the rundown for the rest of the week. But I'm going to invite you to kind of get grounded. So everybody just kind of take a deep breath. And, and I like to really pretend that I have elephant nostrils on the bottom of my feet. So it makes me taking a deeper breath. And it's bathe your bra body in that breath. And what we're learning more and more with uh, COVID is how precious the gift of the lungs are and breathing and then and let all that breath out and just kind of like a balloon totally deflate and just kind of get here in the moment and um, Patricia if you're able and you feel comfortable we'd love to see your face if not we totally understand um, but today um, I wanted to start with a, a quote from Dr. Dunn yesterday when she talked about my my happy genes. The quote that I've kind of stuck with me from yesterday. There you are. Hi, Patricia. The quote that stuck with me from yesterday was, um, I'm going to get a PhD in me. I'm going to get a PhD in me. And I think um, what some people may or may not know that if you drive around your car, which you're not driving around now, most of us aren't, um, 12,000 miles a year, and you're listening to uh, either books on tape or podcast, it's a college education every year. How about that? So if you think about if we were driving today, we're going to spend about 45 minutes together. And so that would be about 45 miles. So you're just getting a little bit of tool notch for a little bit more education. And so you're definitely in for a Wisdom Wednesday today with our guests. So, so Ron's, Ron Hall's life was centered around a successful career as an international art dealer and a passion for his Rocky Top Ranch on Brazos River. All this changed in 1998 as a result of an encounter with a homeless man. Denver Moore, who was threatening to kill everyone in sight of the homeless shelter where Ron had begun to volunteer two weeks earlier. The life-changing encounter featured on many television and radio shows inspired Ron to write his first book, Same Kind of Different as Me, a story of hope and rede redemption. Can you imagine how much hope and redemption we need in today's times? And yet most of us are not homeless. The word of mouth hit became a New York Times platinum bestseller and stayed on the list for more than three and a half years. In 2007, President Bush appointed Ron to the State Department Cultural Property Committee to advise the president on diplomatic matters regarding international art and antiquities. antiquities. Currently, Ron is the screenwriter and producer of the movie version of his book, Same Kind of Different as Me, which can be found on Netflix and Amazon. His new book, Working Our Way Home, released February 20, 2018. Ron and his wife, Beth, reside in Dallas, where they direct the same kind of different as me foundation. Thank you for saying yes and joining me on Wisdom Wednesday today. Well, thanks. It's nice to see you again. Yes. It's nice to see you. Well, we had so much fun in Kansas City with our friends at AMC Theaters um, launching and, and, and celebrating your movie, Same Kind of Different as Me, just by a show of hands. Has anybody read the book, Same Kind of Different as Me, or seen the movie? Pretty, it's pretty great, Patricia, isn't it? Um, I want to tell you, when I read that book, Tom Hill, we talked about earlier, recommended it, and um, it, was, it was a soul changer. You know, there's game changers in every part of your life, but that book uh, changed my soul. So tell us a, a glimpse of the story, just a highlight, because I want everybody to get the movie. Very, very, very quick highlight of the story is uh, in 1998, my late wife, Debbie, uh, had a, a literal dream about a homeless man, uh, obviously, who was poor, but wise. And she said it was like a verse in Ecclesiastes 9.15, where Solomon wrote, there's found in the city a certain poor man who is wise, and by his wisdom, our city and lives would be changed. 
So that next morning after her dream, she asked me to go into the inner city and search for this man of her dreams. And it took a couple of weeks of looking and serving in a homeless shelter until uh, all of a sudden, one evening, we were getting re uh, ready to serve uh, a meal to about uh, 300 uh, homeless men when a big fight breaks out in the, uh, in the dining room and in storms this giant who started the fight that started the fight and he's screaming, he's gonna kill everyone. He said, I'm gonna kill whoever done it. I'm gonna kill whoever stole my shoes. And my wife said, that's him. And I said, that's who? She said, that's the man in my dream. And, I, and she said, and I think I heard from God that you have to be his friend. And I said, well, honey, I was not at that meeting you had. <laughs> and if I'm gonna be friends with someone who wants to kill everybody, then I maybe I should go talk to God myself. So that's how the whole story got started. Wow, what a, what a, what amazing journey you've been on. What year was that in, by the way? It was 1998. That's right. You said 1998. So that's 22 years ago. That's right. Wow. What are some of the gifts you've received from that experience with well, Denver Moore? What I've received is sitting right next to me and my uh, new wife, Beth. <laughs> you know, when you uh, uh, have... It's tragedy that occurs in your life and you don't think things will ever be beautiful again. And then all of a sudden God finds the perfect person to, for you to spend the rest of your life with. And, uh, and that's what he brought me with Beth. And so uh, she helps me run and uh, our homeless foundation, which we, we try to be the 911 call and fulfillment center for uh, underfunded homeless missions. And I'd say that most of them are underfunded, but, we try to work with the smaller one. In fact, there was a mission in, uh, in uh, Kansas last year that they had their electricity and heating cut off for not paying their bills in the coldest month of the winter. So we had to make an emergency request there in Kansas City, uh, or not in Kansas City, but a small town in Kansas, of a, of a woman who was holding a mission in her home to take care of about 30 homeless people. And she used her own home for that. So. Uh, that's what we try to respond to through our website, Same Kind of Different as Me Foundation. And uh, so we get grant requests almost uh, daily, certainly every week for some emergency need. And we just, we have a, we're a small foundation, so we can only give $2,500 uh, per request. That's usually enough to get the power back on or get the, an automobile repaired. Uh, that's a lot of those kind of things. The roof is leaking, the refrigerator went out and uh, the stove broke, you know, all these kind of things when people are operating on a shoestring, uh, trying to, uh, to show God's love to people that a lot of people are unlovable. Like uh, my friend Denver used to say that, uh, that he and I, when we would travel together, that, uh, you know, I, he said, I'm, I'm just an old ex-con and my friend here, Mr. Ron's an old art dealer, but we just two sinners with a message of hope for those that ain't got none. So uh, that's, that's what we still try to do is, is uh, one of the greatest gifts that, that I ever got was my friend Denver, the homeless man who taught me so much. And that's the only reason I'm here today. You're not here to talk to me about my almost 50 year career as an art dealer, international art dealer, where I've sold, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of great masterpieces. But that's not the story that anybody really cares about. You know, the story is how that uh, Denver, a homeless man, gave me hope and so it helped me get uh, my life, uh, you know, redirected uh, from just um, being someone that chased money to someone that, you know, now chases hope for people uh, to give them some hope. So, Well, I'm grateful that uh, you guys joined me today to kind of spread hope and spread wisdom. So Beth, you came onto the scene and I don't know, did you ever get to meet Denver in person? I did, yes, for a little over a year. Yep. And what are some of your takeaways from hope with Denver? I mean, what a gift, you know? Yes, you know, he was um, a quiet kind of mysterious guy. But he, you, you knew there was a lot behind those eyes that you could see. And so it was kind of like he was a kind of a crab where he was hard on the inside, but he had a soft inside. Mm. And, um, you know, I just had great conversations with him and just learned to not judge a book by its cover, you know, to just really kind of get in and, and give someone a chance for who they really are and get to know them. 
You know, I think it's interesting to think about what you just said, hard on the outside and soft on the inside. And as we think about what we're going through right now with this, this fascinating times, and I, and I believe that um, the world has changed forever, you know, in so many ways. Um, some good, not so good. You know, we talked to Kathy Nelson, who, you know, is in charge of big events and um, listening to the news this morning, talking about really shifting Major League Baseball. Well, it may go back to some playing in July, but no fans initially. And that's just really fascinating to think about. So I'm thinking about that, that hope. And from everything you guys have experienced with somebody who had no hope and who was living on the streets and was going to kill somebody because they stole their shoes, I'm guessing most people here on the call probably have too many shoes. Um, and so what, what wisdom would you share with us today? I'm going to go with you, Beth, first, from what everybody's going through around this COVID-19 experience. Oh, gosh, let's see. What would I say? I would say to look at the glass half full, not half empty. And, you know, your mindset, get your mindset and your attitude in a positive place. And, and just look at it, you know, just try to make lemonade out of the lemons or uh, just choose, choose to be positive. So some people, I'm glad you brought up half full, half empty, you know, one of the questionnaires I ask, which I'll be teaching on tonight, actually, for one of our school districts, um, I have this questionnaire that I give people on, on the quadrants of well-being. And one of the questionnaires is, are you a cup half full or cup half empty? And we talked to uh, Dr. Jay Dunn yesterday, who talks about genes, and how some of us genetically are cup half full, I mean, cup half empty. I'm, when you look at me on a scale of zero to 10, I'm probably about a seven. You know, if I'm around the wrong person, it can pull me down. If I'm around the right person, I can go up to a 10. So, so for somebody that may be a three or four, um, what, are some, what, what are some tools that maybe you two have developed in your own lives to look half full? Are there some tools that you've just kind of spun throughout your life to create that? I would say what I listen to, what I read, um, the people say? you hang around, <laughs> yes. Yeah, the people I hang around. Yeah, you people. are, what, what's the quote you give me all the time? You are the sum of what? Uh, the five people that you spend the most time with. Yeah. Well, we're definitely getting some good things because we've been around some of the same people here the last three weeks joining on this these calls today. And then we I would say have some listening. So, so it's just a, some thoughts on to it. It's hard. And as Jay was talking about yesterday, I love how they kind of tie together um, who's like a genetic expert and she has a myhappygenes.com and chatting about how some people you can maybe take the right vitamin it could be maybe you need vitamin D or vitamin B or something else to enhance your system so those are some thoughts there you know um, when you think about resilience and you've been around a lot of people that um, are homeless how, what are some of the resilient skills you've learned from them or how any knowledge you want to share around that either one of you either one of you Oh, well, we've been around a lot of homeless people. We've taken homeless people in our home to uh, live with us. And, uh, you know, the, the thing in, in, in our case of, of being with homeless people, it's to accept them for who God made them and not for who we want them to be, but for us to encourage them to be the best version of themselves. And so, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've done this uh, on, on several occasions and uh, we've had some success and some not success yet. So, uh, but we, uh, we believe that, you know, ultimately God is in charge of these people. He made them like he made us. And so if we can help them be the, uh, the better version, uh, but it, it takes love, it takes forgiveness. Uh, you know, our whole story is based on forgiveness. In fact, uh, my new friend, uh, Catherine Schwarzenegger, uh, what's her name now? Catherine oh, Schwarzenegger. Pratt. Pratt. Yes. yes. So she, she married, uh, Chris, Pratt. Chris Pratt, the actor and changed her name, but she just wrote a book on forgiveness and she did a chapter on my story and Denver's story and Debbie's story because our story is based on forgiveness because if, if you've read our book or seen our film, you know that I was an unfaithful husband. And the forgiveness that Debbie showed me, which was Christ-like, she threw my sin as far as the East is from the West, never to bring it up again, in turn for my promise to never do that again. And, but it was that forgiveness that led us on a path to rebuild a life, that, a marriage that we had together 
restore family, and uh, and and then the love you know that that it took to give the forgiveness, and then the greater love that came as a result of the forgiveness. Uh, that's the reason that I became friends with Denver because I had promised her I would do anything that she asked me the rest of our lives together for that forgiveness. And of course, when she asked me to uh, be friends with this uh, homeless man who was known on the streets as suicide, everybody called him suicide because he had no friends. He didn't speak to anybody. He didn't want any friends and he lived by a dumpster uh, that was got his back and he carried a baseball bat and beat the tar out of anybody that looked cross-eyed at him. You know, he just, he just uh, was, was an angry, angry man, but he was absent of love. He needed forgiveness. And, uh, and all of those things came together to, um, to restore a life that became such a beautiful story. And uh, as you know, in, in our new book, I'll show you here the cover called Working Our Way Home. Uh, I'm reading this every night on our Facebook page, same kind of different as me, uh, Foundation Facebook page. I read that every night uh, just to encourage people that, you know, uh, what we see sometimes, um, uh, Denver, my homeless friend, suicide, used to tell me that, you know, most of you folks see the homeless as a problem. But let me tell you how God sees us. He said, God sees us as an opportunity for the faithful to show his love. So uh, that's what we have tried to, to do is just show love and, and, and mercy and forgiveness. And those kind of things are what changes lives. And in and, and this time of, uh, of what, what I've been calling uh, Corona jail, <laughs> uh, but actually it's been a good sentence because we've had t time to reach out to people that we've not talked to uh, in ages. Uh, Beth is really good at that. And uh, just reaching out yesterday to a friend of hers that she's not talked to in years and having a great, a long conversation. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's just checking in with people and just reminding them of, of how uh, important they are in our lives or how important they have been in our lives. And, and we've missed, you know, missed out by doing these things. So this is one of the good things that's, that's coming out of, uh, of Corona is, is taking the time to go back and check in with people that have been important in your lives and to thank them for that. Well, I love it. I love check in, reach out and then thank them, mm -hmm. right? Check in, reach out and then thank them. Uh, you know, in my second book, uh, E Factor Engage, Energize, and Rich, that's what we talk about in Rich. And I think the time, this time gives you a chance to reflect and look about the people that have kind of helped navigate your life. Just like, Ron, Ron, would you say that it was probably just part of God's plan for you to meet Denver? Oh, absolutely. It wasn't my plan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was definitely, uh, in, in fact, Denver, uh, you know, uh, before he went to heaven, he would tell everybody that uh, it was this is totally a God story. It wasn't my story or his story. This was a God story because, you know, it just not could not have happened. I mean, how did someone? Uh, I was an international art dealer that traveled the world, dealing with the fanciest people in the world and selling masterpieces and with major museums. You know, I'd never been in a homeless shelter. Uh, you know, I, I didn't want to be in a homeless shelter. That was not on my bucket list. And then to be friends with a man who was an ex-con, who did not read or write, who didn't know uh, uh, a Rembrandt from a Jackson Pollock. You know, he knew, didn't know uh, anything about art. He knew nothing. Uh, in fact, not having uh, learned to read and write, he was never given the opportunity to go to school. But um, not, not, not even... Um, he was not interested in anything. He was only interested in the spirit world of just sitting and listening for God to speak to him. Mm -hmm. So uh, he didn't know sports. Uh, in fact, I asked him, I said, who was the, did you know uh, any presidents? You know, we were doing it. We were going through a presidential election at that time in 19 uh, in 2000. I said, tell me all the names of the presidents you, you know. And he says, Abraham Lincoln, he mm -hmm. set us free. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, that's the only president you ever heard of? He said, yeah. He said, I know about one, wasn't one killed in Dallas. 
And I said, yeah. And he said, what was his name? I said, Kennedy. He said, yeah, I know about him too. So that's the only thing he knew. He didn't know sports, current events, uh, or politics. He only knew the spirit world and what, you know, he believed that God spoke to him and just uh, put him on this earth for a purpose, but he couldn't figure out why because he said nothing was ever going his way until Miss Debbie showed him some love. So, When did you, uh, I'm going to you first, Beth, on this, and I'll come back to you, Ron. Beth, when did you realize the magic of having Ron in your life? And, um, I, you know, I know I've heard the story, but I don't remember the story, and neither does anybody else here on that. When did you realize there was magic in that? And then, Ron, I'm going to come to you and ask, at what point in the relationship with Denver? Was it two minutes in? Was it? 10 years in that, did you realize how it was going to significantly change your life? But first to you, Beth, on that question. How did I know it was magic? I would yeah. say from the first date, uh, because the first date, just we, the, the way it was set up, I, I had left Texas. I was in South Carolina. He got word that I left. Then, you know, just giving me, inviting me to go on these beautiful, romantic, extravagant trips. Um, uh, you know, we, I met in Paris. We went from one trip to the next. We, our first date, we say, lasted 90 days. And so just right from the get-go, it was magical. And, and then to learn about the story and to meet Denver and then just to be a part of the whole scenario was just, I couldn't believe, you know, that, that I was a part of it. And then at that time, we were making a movie with Disney. So that was exciting and kind of a whirlwind. And, um, and then that didn't work out. And so then there began the whole journey and adventure of making the movie. So that took on, you know, several years of our, our relationship at the beginning. But I would say from the first date, 90 day first date, you know, ending up in Italy, <laughs> starting in Paris, France, ending up in Italy. It was like just a fairy tale. So. Well, thank, thinking about the first date, and um, by the way, to our listeners here today that are live with us, this is a great time to post any questions you have. Um, and uh, you know the drill if you've been with me for the last few days. So go ahead and post those questions and we'll bring them up. So uh, um, I'm not sure unless you've been around you guys enough, and, and this is the second or third time we've had a conversation. We met in Kansas City for the showing. You've been so gracious sharing your time and knowledge and your, most of all your heart. That's what I see when I see both of you. Um, but there's been some hard moments, you know, right? been some hard moments where maybe life was not going as you wanted to possibly financially or otherwise. Do you want to share one of those hard moments just so people know that you're real? You're not somebody who's living this extravagance life. I want to get back to the point where just a, while it's still on my mind, you know, because now that I uh, have this aging brain, but uh, I tell people that Beth has the hardest job of any wife in America or one of them because she has to go with me uh, every day. You know, we're, we're, we're constantly together, even though she has some, her own business, but uh, she has to listen to a husband. She's married to a man who will not shut up talking about his first wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's a hard job that she has taken with grace and mercy. And she just shows it. Uh, she's just embraces that role as uh, someone is, who's keeping the legacy of my uh, late wife uh, in the forefront and to, uh, trying to make a difference, uh, using her talents to make a difference in keeping the legacy of my first wife alive. I honor her for that. Yes. Yeah. Lift you up there. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, back to the other question was, uh, what was it? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I, oh, the magic, oh, the magic of Denver. Well, uh, well, know, hang on, hang on. But I want people to hear that it's not been all easy because I was reminded about the kind of the moment when you're ready to give up and somebody shows up in your life. Well, that's true. And, and, and we had gone through, uh, you know, when, when Beth and I got married, I basically gave my children, uh, I, as if I had died, I gave them their inheritance early just to, so that they wouldn't, uh, they didn't think I should get remarried again. That, uh, you know, but I had been single 11 years after Debbie died when Beth and I got married. And so I thought I had given myself enough time <laughs> and I was lonely. So, uh, so 
So we just went ahead and gave them everything, uh, knowing that we kept a little bit to live on and make a movie. Well, we ended up having problems with the movie. We had a lot of uh, well-intentioned people that turned out to be not uh, so good for us. And, and so we ended up losing most of our money trying to make the film, trying to change the way that the world sees the homeless. And this was our mission was, we really wanted to make a difference in the, the way that uh, the people see the homeless, to see them, the homeless through God's eyes, you know. And because uh, Denver used to tell me, he said, Mr. Ron, you know, why is it that all you Christians worship one homeless man on Sunday and turn your back on the first one you see on Monday? He said, Mr. Ron, you never know whose eyes God is watching you out of, and it ain't going to be your preacher or your Sunday school teacher. He said, it might be a fellow that looks like me. He said, no, it ain't me. It might be a fellow that looks like me, and God's checking you out to see what kind of person you really are. So, uh, you know, that our purpose in making this movie and starting this foundation was to change the way that people see and, and react with the homeless. And uh, for some reason, uh, and I'm not blaming this on God, I have to take, you know, I have to own my part of it, but we made some bad decisions along the way. Uh, I gave up a very successful art career to work only for the homeless and this film. And that uh, had, didn't pay off uh, financially, you know, you may have some crowns in heaven, but. <laughs> I mean, people think that we're Yeah, rich, millionaires, they think means. yes. And I, I say, listen, you know, we live very modestly. We haven't made one penny from the movie. We've People not made are a penny shocked to movie. hear that we haven't made one penny from the movie. And millions so. from the book went to the homeless. So, uh, you know, this is, we've done all these things. I this, think it's a test. This is a <laughs> test. Now, now, this new book, Working Our Way Home, <laughs> me and Beth. <laughs> and this is uh, the, 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 the title of that, which is so beautiful, is that uh, Denver, one of the, the first times when I knew the magic happened with Denver is after our catch and release meeting, which is very, very well documented. Uh, uh, when he said, you know, he didn't want to, he did wasn't looking for any friends and didn't want to be a friend to anybody, and especially white people, because when he was young, the white people uh, roped and dragged him behind horses. Uh, they were Klansmen uh, for helping a white woman change a flat tire on the plantation. So he had made a promise never again to speak to a white person. But when I kept asking him to be my friend, and he said, uh, he said, there's something that bothered him about white people. And that was, and I said, what is that? He said, well, it's got to do with fishing. I said, well, Denver, I'm not a fisherman. I'm an art dealer. And uh, that's, I know about art, but I'm not, I'm not a fisherman. He said, but I bet you can answer the question. And I said, so, okay, what is the question? He said, well, I heard when white people go fishing, they do this thing they call catch and release. I said, well, of course they do, Denver, it's a sport. And uh, you don't get it? He said, no, sir, I don't get it. Because back on the plantation where I grew up in Louisiana, we'd go out in the morning, we'd dig us a can full of worms, cut us a cane pole, and sit on the riverbank all day. And when we got something on our line, we were really proud of what we caught. Mm -hmm. And he said, so it just occurred to me, if you're a white man fishing for a friend, and you're going to catch and release, I ain't got no desire to be your friend. But if you is fishing for a real friend, then I'll be your friend for life. That was a magical moment to me. If I've ever heard from God in my life, if it's that that moment, take a chance and be his friend. And I did, and I can tell you, God completely repainted the canvas of my life and rewrote my life story on that day. And the next morning, uh, I went to be with him uh, by his dumpster, sitting on the curb by his dumpster. And he still scared the living daylights out of me. I mean, here was a guy known as suicide that threatened everybody that came around him. And he sat there with his baseball bat and I took a seat next to him by his dumpster. And he didn't say anything. I didn't say anything and I was getting scared. So I just said, uh, what's it like to be homeless? And he looked at me like I was the biggest idiot in the world. And he said, well, I don't know. Why don't you tell me? Well, I've never been homeless. I don't, I don't know uh, what it's like to be homeless. Uh, and he said, uh, well, let me tell you something, Mr. Ron. Whether we is rich 
or whether we is poor or something in between, this earth ain't no final resting place. He says, so in a way, we all homeless, just working our way home. So in honor of my friend Denver, I named our book, Working Our Way Home. And that's actually a picture of uh, two of us that, that we, we were working at my ranch one day uh, on the cover. So it's, uh, it's a beautiful story. I said it's, it's, the, it's the story of a grieving millionaire and a homeless ex-con thrown together to save each other because that's literally what we did. I, I'd say that Denver did far more for me than I ever did for him. Even though we lived together for more than 10 years after Debbie went to heaven, uh, I received a much more benefit from that and, and, than, than he did, even though he became the first person in the history of the New York Times, a best-selling list, to not know how to read and write when he wrote his first book that became a number one New York Times bestseller. <laughs> I, I wonder what Denver would say about today's times where people are being, their foundations being um, reorganized. And I would say your foundation was reorganized, Ron, and, and maybe more in alignment with what you were here to do on the planet. So I wonder what he would say now. What would you think Denver would say right now about today's times? Oh, in today's times? Well, I know exactly what he would say <laughs> because anytime something was kind of out of the ordinary happened, he'd look at me and he'd say, Mr. Ron, you know, if the devil ain't messing with you, he's already got you. Mm. Well, I know that this is maybe some evil that is messing with us. This is not God, you know, because God is about good and evil is not. But so this is the force of good and evil right now that, that, it, that we're, we're fighting uh, this battle with, uh, with COVID and, and everything else. And I just, uh, I believe that, uh, you know, Denver was the wisest man that I ever met. I mean, I, someone was uh, talking to me the other day that, that wanting me to write a book just on the wisdom of Denver. It, take me out of the whole thing uh, because our books here are about our relationship and our friendship. But Denver was the wisest man, and I would like to honor him and his wisdom because, I mean, he is, he is so smart. <laughs> well, I would... Uh... It's I feel that you have honored him and he brought out the wisdom in you and you brought out the wisdom in him. Mm -hmm. And so it's that it's, it's, you both needed each other. It's kind of like salt and pepper. You know, you needed each other to have bring this message. I want to I want to celebrate you a little bit. I'm, I'm a word nerd. Celebrate, guide, connect, hope. I, I want to celebrate you. And how much money have you raised for the homeless? Beth and Ron, how much have you guys raised? We have helped raise through our books and through our speaking events, which you been to and seen. Uh, we've raised uh, probably $110 million for the homeless. In fact, uh, that's probably collectively, whatever, yeah, 15 coll years. Yeah, collectively that's over awesome. 15 years. Right before Denver went to heaven, uh, we had raised about 60 million by that time. And uh, he had given all his money away. Uh, and he had he'd become a millionaire and gave it all back to the homeless. And, and I had given all of mine to uh, my children and, and lawyers and movie people. And uh, so we were talking about that, how, how we had making a movie and had a number one New York Times bestseller and we were both broke. And he said, Mr. Ron, did you ever think about all these millions, it's about that time, it's 60 million, just keeping a few dollars of that for that for ourselves? And I started laughing. I said, sounds like you have. He said, yeah, I sure do. I said, well, I think if we had kept it, that God would not have honored what we have done. And I think what we have done is more, uh, is, is more important than the money that we've received from it. So. Well, you make me think of the phrase that um, has stuck with me for four decades. And this is a great time for questions, by the way, as we start to wrap up people, if you have questions and maybe share the love. But I think about, um, uh, what is it? Broke the state of, no, poor the state of mind, broke the state of being. Oh, Have you heard that before? Poor the state of mind, broke the state of being. And so I've tried to never use the word poor when I was broke, mm -hmm. you know, so that I didn't own that poorness in my soul. And, and, and I, I believe um, that the, the gift of your heart, once again, I, I hope everybody here watches the movie 
Um, I personally love the book. I'm truly, it changed, it changed my life, the way I looked at homeless people. It also, it just changed my life and just people in general. And I, I'm, my genetics are kind of a kind person. That's just who I am. But it even stepped, me, stepped it up a notch and to really think about some of the words you said. There's a book out right now. Is it called White, White Fragility, maybe? Have you guys seen that book yet? No. It's, I know it's downstairs, like two stories down outside, run and get it. But I can't do that and get back up without losing my breath and losing the track. But I think it's called White Fragility. And um, another, it's on, my, it's on my next reading list here. So Mark asks, where can we see the movie? What's the best, what's the best win for you guys for us to get the movie? Netflix or Amazon? Netflix or the DVD. You can order DVD on Amazon or it's on Amazon, but uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's widely available on DVD. In fact, the Blu-ray version is, is what I like the best because, you know, Paramount ended up cutting out 20 minutes of the film. And in the Blu-ray version, they show a bonus content of about 10 or 15 scenes that they cut out that I thought were important. And so we put that back in, in the Blu-ray version uh, of the DVD, DVD and Blu-ray. I don't, you know, one is Blu-ray and one's DVD. Well, and also in, um, when the movie came out, they released a movie version of the book and it, they used the movie poster on the book. And, um, I never know where to look, by the way. Do I look at the dot up at the top or do I look at you? I yeah. never know. I don't know either. I, I, yeah, just I, look, look whatever. I see you. You're looking, you're looking at me. I'm, I'm talking to you. So. Okay. Uh, so in that book with good. the movie poster, at the end of the book, they included four chapters uh, on making the movie. And so that kind of tells you all the trials and tribulations and the twists and turns it took to get the movie on the big screen. That's what they tell the story of the, the people showing up in the restaurant, right? Yes. On that bike where you guys stopped at some place on a bike, r on a motorcycle ride and that's right. somebody yeah. showed up. That's that I'm not going to tell the rest of it because that's worth you getting the book. It was, it's a great story of hope, redemption, um, really just, just listening. Like, like I said, I, I know we're in this fascinating time right now and life is much easier to live backwards than it is forward. So so as you guys look back on life, the last, yeah, I don't know, three or four decades, um, what would be your top two or, three, two or three things that you think about? Even, let's say even away from, I don't know, can you separate life from Denver, pre-Denver, post-Denver? You can't. Uh, not really, you know, because it, he, he took over, I guess our friendship really took over uh, my life for my family, uh, for my new wife, uh, for everything, it, it's our whole life really uh, revolves around my friendship with Denver. The you know on being on programs like this and on TV shows and writing new books and the friends that we meet uh, come. You know our we do speaking events all across America and uh, you know for you if you have your friends want to book us for an event uh, they can go to our uh, same kind of different as me foundation website. But all of those events have been canceled this year. <laughs> so we're, we're now taking events for the fall. But, uh, you know, it's our, our life is really, uh, this, this is our life. People, you know, I, I say that uh, if I, I, I guess I thought my legacy would be as an art dealer. And, but now I know that even if I sold the Mona Lisa to the Pope, that I would be still known more for my friendship with a homeless ex-con named Suicide. So, because he defined my life. And uh, You know, I, I'm thinking about my Denver Moore and my Denver Moore was Dr. Yenny, who really put in this, into awareness, this whole person health model. And it's kind of how I, it's, it's, it's a legacy. I'm just continuing his legacy. And he just had it, he just would have had his birthday, his uh, I believe 88th birthday. So it's fascinating to think about how people can just drip into your life and it just takes off. And, and so as we think about the, the, the experience we're having right now, I, a connection's huge. And Ron, you mentioned the word lonely. And, uh, you know, Beth came into your life. I think there's so many people that are surrounded by people, but they're lonely. What, what, what wisdom would you have around the word lonely? Depression, anxiety, but mostly the word lonely. Either one of you. Well, I, I know that uh, my friend Denver is the one that helped me out of that. And uh, I'd say that 
I'm embarrassed to say this to all of your friends and followers, but I was so lonely and depressed that I refused to get dressed. And mm -hmm. I would sit in my backyard by the swimming pool, naked, drinking wine and smoking cigars. <laughs> so, uh, and Denver would somehow find me and tell me to get up, you know, that, uh, that I, I did not, uh, I wasn't doing myself any favor. I had to move on and 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 look at the at, for the good and in something instead of just the bad and the negative. So uh, just my friendship with him, he helped me out of that situation. So if you know of someone that's going through that, just be a friend for them and encourage them. Uh, you know, there there are still good things in everyone's life that is lonely. And but I'd, I'd say if you're lonely. It's because you're probably not taking the steps to get out of it because, you know, you can uh, call up a friend. You can do all of these things. It's hard. But if you know someone that's lonely, it's better as friends also to call them and, uh, uh, and just encourage them. So. You know, I, I, I'm not sure, I, you know, I'm, you actually just made me think of uh, somebody that I've been coaching for a couple of years. I think some people don't feel like they have a friend. And what if, what if you feel like you're all alone and you have no friends? What, what advice would you share? Well, um, actually, I'd say that, you know, you do have a friend in God because he created you and uh, he made you for a purpose. And you need to really try to uh, examine what your purpose is. And, uh, you know, even just to, if you get in, get in his word or read some books of encouragement. Uh, but, uh, you know, loneliness is a killer. It can, it can kill people. Uh, it, it causes depression and all of the, the kinds of things that, uh, you know, nothing really good comes from loneliness and depression. So uh, I, I wish you are, you are certainly a person that can encourage people out of that. You're asking an old art dealer that, you know, in, it doesn't know much about those things because I have really only been depressed one time in my life. And it was just a few months after the death of, uh, of a, a wife that I was married to for 30 years who, uh, who set my life on a new path by her dream. And so, you know, I, I was, um, I was very depressed over that. I was, I was angry at God because I thought, why would God take a woman who dedicated her life, to serving the homeless and, and leave some of the bad critters that are still out there on the street. Denver did the same thing. I said, he, he asked God the same question. And uh, because he said, why didn't you take me instead of Miss Debbie? She was doing all the good and I ain't done no good for nobody. And, uh, but he said, he heard from God. He said, well, that's what I did for my own son. I brought him home. And he said, so maybe that's what I'm doing for Miss Debbie. So that people will know her story and will be encouraged by it to get involved and make a difference in their friends' lives and in, in their community and, and whatever uh, Im, Im, uh, impact or, or influence they can have among uh, their peers and, and friends. And stuff. So. Well, the way I feel the Holy Spirit is I get chills down my left side and I just got those. And so for those of you struggling is... Um, you know, it just keeps showing up, you know, and in my, I have a principle of LTR, lifetime relationships, and, um, and what is show up, and that's what you're doing by showing up here today, and, and getting some type of wisdom, or some type of nuggets, and, and what I love of what Eleanor and Zach are doing, they're sending you the nuggets the next day, hopefully, Dorothy, you got those, if you didn't, I remembered your message, said you didn't get those, but we want to share these nuggets, so hopefully, you'll share them with your friends, and, and we're just creating a ripple, just like the story of Beth and Debbie and Ron Hall and Denver Moore have created hope for somebody else to latch on to. And that's what I'm going to encourage all of you to do. Latch on to the word hope and latch on to your faith. And if you don't have faith, just work to find it. And it's create a window to really dive in to that faith. You know, um, there's just so much, so much wisdom in the call today. You know, uh, Patricia asked, um, when did Denver die and what did he die of and when? He died um, March 31st, um, 2012. 2012. He died of COPD, which, uh, you know, his lungs just basically shut down. I, 
I thought that he probably had cancer, but I took him to the doctor often and he coughed all the time and couldn't breathe very well. Uh, very much like COVID, I guess, except <clears throat> he had started smoking at five years old and that was, he never gave up smoking. So that's, that's what killed him. The gene, sir. You know, um, have you ever thought about going back to your rich art dealer self? Has it ever been saying, you know what, I, I was at this fork in the road and I went this way. Can I go back to my old fork and wonder where you would have been had you just stayed the art dealer? Well, uh, absolutely. Because when I, my uh, car with 176,000 miles on it broke down the other day and I couldn't afford to get another one, <laughs> I said, yeah, I think I'm going to go back and start selling some art again. So uh, anyway, I, I think there's a, a time... You know, I, I believe that I have, uh, God has used me uh, mightily in the last 20 years for this homeless cause, but I, I also, now I have a reason to provide and leave something, uh, not only just a legacy of, of books and things like that, but I need to uh, leave a, a, maybe some kind of a retirement fund for, <laughs> for Beth. And so I do, I'm, I'm back in that art world again. And uh, just small, just in the last few months, so we have a small art gallery that yeah. we're starting to get. Well, there's a nice piece of art behind you. I'm 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 I'm, not, I'm admiring that. Oh, that was our wedding gift from a, a Cuban American artist named Julio Laraz. Yeah. And so he and Ron have a, a long friendship, and that was that was my first piece of art to receive. Mm -hmm. Well, Tribe, I'm on my last question. So if you have anything you want to share um, in the chat notes, this is a good time to do that. So um, here's, here's my, oh, I've got two questions. I'm going to go with one question because I, I promised you 45 minutes and we're at uh, 48 right now. Um, what medicine, Beth, to you, what, what's your medicine for you to share with the world? You know, we all have medicine we give. What's your medicine? What is mine? I've never been asked that before. Is my medicine? I can tell you, it's dance. <laughs> I come down every morning. She goes to dance class every morning um, because she does this exercise fitness. It's like Zumba or something like that. And but she doesn't. No matter how she feels, she gets up and she goes to this That's dance true. class. Now, now she's doing it online in the living room. So I'm upstairs trying to do business or write or something. But I hear this music downstairs, and she's just dancing away. But that makes her, uh, that that's true. her medicine. It's good medicine for her. It keeps her healthy and alive. And, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Well, I think your medicine's joy. Every time I'm with you, I just see a joy. I see joy guides all around you. So oh. I would say how you're sharing the world is joy. Um, okay. So since he answered yours, what's, what's Ron's medicine for the world? Oh, what's um, I would say motivation. He, he is a motivational speaker. He's a great storyteller. He has great stories to tell. He's led a very interesting life. And I think that you influence people. People look up to you and want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. So I think it's the gift of gab, the gift of storytelling, maybe. Gift of gab. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how can people connect? How can we support what you're doing? What's the best way for us to do that? Besides maybe buy the movie, well, number one. Buy the book. I love it. Well, this is, yeah, Beth has a copy of the movie version of the book that mm -hmm. tells how, how the movie got made. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, our, our same kind foundation. Uh, you know, if you know someone that, that is looking for a motivational speaker or fundraiser or anything like that, you can go to our uh, website on our same kind foundation. Uh, if you, you want a personalized a copy of Working Our Way Home or any of our books, uh, if you make a donation to our foundation, I'll send you a personalized copy of our yeah. books. You also and have a, a website for yourself that kind of promotes you and the different things that you do. That's right. Just ronrhall.com as well. But uh, anyway, and I, I'm just, I'm thinking too that I would have not have known you if we had not come to Kansas City the first time. So my one of my good friends from high school who ended up living in Kansas City is on the board of AMC, Lloyd and Sue Ann Hill invited us to Kansas City and yep. so many good things have come from that so yep. I would be remiss if I didn't honor them for them insisting that I come to Kansas City about three years ago and just life has become beautiful with a lot of good people like you in Kansas City and I and I appreciate your friendship. Well and their son Ron yes. and his wife Barbie are dear friends of mine 
Barbie actually did an interview on April 1st of my podcast. She kind of reversed it because, you know, she's a, was a TV personality. And so she, we kind of did a joint interview where she actually got to be the one asking questions. Um, <laughs> kind of put me on the, put me on the pickle seat too. So, well, um, first of all, I, so thank you so much for having the courage to friend Denver and share his story. Um, the people on the, sh on the show today that are live with us today, um, first of all, thank you for joining us. I'm so grateful. I, it's so much more fun for me to do an interview. I probably will not go back to the old way I did podcast interviews because I love seeing a few faces and hearing your reactions. So people, I get emails every day, people wanting to be on the podcast. I'm like, you know what? Um, just I'm retooling it. Call me, bring me back in um, June. And we're going to be doing the Rhythm and Resilience Monday through Friday in, uh, not Monday through Friday, Monday and Friday um, in the month of May. We've got some great, great guests lined up and remind you that tomorrow we have Sonia Choquette, who's been a friend of mine for 20 years, and, um, and we'll have a great conversation about intuition. You probably remember her daughter, Sonia Tolley, was on Fun Friday a few weeks ago, and boy, was she a home run, uh, just like today's guest. So, so here's some love for you. Um, beautiful story. Thanks for sharing with us. That's from Bridget. Miriam agreed. Um, you're keeping Denver's spirit alive. And when you say Denver, I don't think it's just, I think it's just good, the Holy Spirit. You know, when I think of Denver, I think about God's wisdom talking through this. If we can all be uh, Jesus with clothes on as we go out and we take the next word we say to the person, whether it's them handing us our to-go meal since we're doing to-go or it's being nice to the Costco person or the grocery person. I've heard that some people are, they're just getting cranky. So, so put on that, put on that, what would Jesus do or that, that God thoughts as you're doing it. Um, so thank you for keeping that story alive. Um, Mark says, I'm going to miss my meeting every day. Thank you, Ron. It's very inspiring. I want to just say, um, you just inspire me. Um, I have blessing bags in my car. Oh. So now when I pull up at a place and there's somebody that has a different uh, fortune than I do, I make sure I share with that. And because of something you said, Ron, I don't just share that. I typically throw some dollars in there too, because I think people can be in judgment of how are they going to drink this or whatever they're going to do. You know what? Who cares? You know, if I've been fortunate enough to share. It's important to ask them their name. Yes. Very important. And, yeah, I, and just say, amazing. hey, I'm sorry you're having to do this. And, if, you know, I, I, if, I, if I find that I'm going to say a prayer for you for your, just through your name, because I don't know your circumstances. But if I find time to get back around, circle back around, and God puts us together again, I want to sit down and have a conversation with you. So, but you know, usually those kind of things are very passing, and you got to go, and you got to move. But, great. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, it's very important to ask their name. Just I'm going to pray for you guys. So, so here's thank you. Thank you for reminding me that because I, I needed to hear that too. That's my major takeaway. What's your name? And I think we all have the, not I, not I think, I know after being in the customer care business for so long is we have those four letters on our forehead, MMFI, make me feel important. Yeah. And you sure have made us all feel important today with your time, with your energy, with your love. Thank you for um, inspiring uh, me to be a better human being and inspiring millions of people. We love you. We bless you. Um, Dorothy says, I keep treats in my car. Uh, I, I felt uh, God every time I give something away. All right. We love you. We bless you. Hey, everybody, I'll see you tomorrow. Um, go out and make it a great day. Sprinkle some love out there. For having us. Bye. Bye. Check us out on our website, uh, same kind of our Facebook page. I'll be reading our book tonight. So. Okay, we'll put that on there. We'll send show notes to everybody. Um, after the show, we'll send you a copy as well. All okay. right. Okay. Bye-bye. I sure appreciate you listening to Small Changes Big Shifts. If you go to the website, smallchangesbigshifts.com, we'll have the show notes ready for you there. If this episode inspired you to make a small change that will lead to a big shift, please share with a friend. You can catch our episode on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and our website. And if you feel like it, please leave a rating or a comment. Be sure to subscribe so you can catch our episode next week. Blessings to you.